Hello everyone. Um, we have gathered today at uh, Alpha Cyprus Studios uh, in order to do a podcast, uh, which is going to be um, a pre-event of our main event, uh, which is hosting the Minister of uh, Energy in our school. So we're going to di- we're going to discuss today uh, all of the factors that relate with energy and why this um, element uh, is important for us as a topic. Um, and uh, hopefully we're going to set the, uh, the grounds for a productive talk um, at school grounds. Most importantly, we would all like to thank Alpha Cyprus for their hospitality and um, their um, uh, willingness to offer their facilities for this uh, podcast. Uh, so let's cut to the chase immediately and let's begin um, our conversation. So here with us, we have Mario Stavrou, we have Jahid uh, Gensh, and we have Yannis Agabiu. They are all economic students, and we are going to set the beginning for uh, the talk, which is going to follow at school. So guys, um, we are throwing the event on energy, right? The title of our event is Energy, Crisis, Potential, Opportunities, right? And Policy. So why is crisis important for us as a topic of discussion? Why uh, do we want to host uh, the Minister of Energy in school grounds in order to discuss this? Um, Yanni? Uh, yeah, so uh, energy is important because first of all, it is a cause of production. So um, um, all, m- most, if not all businesses uh, require some form of transportation transporting like their raw materials or their finished goods to the uh, shops, uh, which means that uh, if the energy prices which are rising because of the of the war, uh, mainly, uh, uh, it will cause an increase in the cost of production, which um, uh, will force firms to either increase their prices and reflect um, the increase in cost on consumers uh, and consumers will be required to um, pay higher prices or they will um, um, start making losses or okay uh, so you are touching two topics there you are touching the topic of inflation okay yes due to cost of production you are touching the element of deterioration in living standards because of high energy prices and most importantly I think that you imply um, an impact on long-run costs and long-run productivity because of the reduction in profitability and therefore a reduction in investment uh, in in the long run. Okay, so this may have a possible impact on long-term growth, essentially, right? Yes. Okay. Is there anything else? Basically, as mentioned, the chapter on energy is multifaceted and affects a series of, of economic objectives. So by exploring the effects of energy, we can conclude about unemployment, inflation, and the long-run potential of the economy, as you mentioned. Okay. Okay. So energy definitely links with macroeconomic objectives, right? So up to now, um, we mentioned production costs, we mentioned profitability. Anything else, Jahid? So in addition to what my friend said, I believe that energy is what fuels the economy. And um, the fluctuations in the price, the effects of the fluctuations, is uh, mainly dependent on if the country is self-sufficient, which means that it produces its own, own energy at a great scale, or if it's like Cyprus, us, where we import 90% of our energy, and the fluctuations impact the macroeconomy and its uh, impacts on the people uh, to a great extent. All right. Another area that we have been discussing through the normal curriculum since year four, right, is the impact on energy on externalities, positive and negative externalities. Obviously, the first thing that comes in mind when um, we discuss energy is negative externalities because when we are trying to produce energy, right, we have the environment, okay? And obviously, for the case of Cyprus, this makes things worse because according to what you told me at school, guys, we are suffering uh, penalties which increase even more uh, the price of energy. But I was wondering, are there any positive externalities resulting out of energy and if um, um, uh, communities and societies make good um, use of energy with reduced prices and opportunities that relate to reduced prices? 
Uh, of course, assuming we have the incentive for R&D, and usually this comes through a competitive market, and this is what the privatization of the electricity authority in Cyprus aims to achieve, then you promote R&D, and through R&D you minimize costs and also improve methods that are friendlier to the environment. Okay. Um, what's the what's the trend do you think now uh, from this perspective? I mean, uh, what's the new type of energy used all over Cyprus? And uh, uh, it is an entrepreneurial activity as well. Uh, solar energy. Solar energy. Solar energy is, is appearing to be quite profitable yes. for Cyprus, right? Yeah, well, subsidies are also being given by the government for uh, domestic, like for houses to um, place solar panels on their roofs. So mm-hmm, yes, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's an incentive for people to do it as well. Okay. Um, last year, when we were doing, uh, for the first time, micro, we were talking about the accelerator effect, if you remember that, all right? So do you think uh, that there is some sort of accelerator uh, when uh, an initial investment is done in, for example, the case of, of solar energy? Do you think it will lead to an accelerator effect? Um, I believe that yes, it will indeed lead to an accelerator effect because let's say we have 10 companies within an industry and if one of them invests in solar energy, its competitors will effectively think that they will lower their costs and uh, increase their market share through lower prices and therefore I believe that they will be encouraged to do the same investment. Okay. And given the fact that consumption is expected to rise because now it's the time to switch to green energy. Uh, because of the war, because of the inflation and the high costs, expecting consumption implies that firms will increase their investment in green energy. Good. Anything else for that um, um, for that topic? I think that's about it. Okay. All right. So um, let's begin with um, our areas uh, of investigation. So our title, our theme is energy crisis opportunities and policy. So, Jahid, uh, can you please describe the current crisis and tell us if there is an impact on, the, on this crisis uh, globally uh, in Europe and what is the specific impact in the context of Cyprus? Of course, I would love to. Uh, so, first of all, the current crisis is due to the restricted supply coming from Eastern Europe, which is the primary source of energy for most European countries, such as Germany, which is the uh, biggest economy in Europe. And the chart in front of me suggests that um, before the war broke out, the European gas prices in terms of uh, euros per megawatt hour soared from um, below 30 euros per megawatt to over 300 per megawatt. So this basically implies that the cost for consumers is really high to maintaining their needs within their household, especially for low income earners because they tend to spend a higher proportion of their income on uh, necessities required to survive, basically. Mm-hmm. In the concept of context of Cyprus, although they still um, don't import uh, their oil or gas from Eastern Europe as much as um, countries which are geographically closely uh, clustered together, um, they are still affected. And the other chart in front of me suggests that um, there's about uh, 90% increase in the prices in Cyprus which is uh, significantly lower than the increase in Germany, especially. But I believe that it still has a negative effect. Why do you think um, we experience uh, a lower rate in the rate of increase of energy prices? A lower rate of increase? Well, isn't it what you, what you suggested? You, you, you told me, you just told us that uh, energy prices in Cyprus are not rising as fast as those in Germany. Right? Yes. Okay. Is there any reason why we are lucky enough, at least from this perspective, not to experience this high rate in energy prices? We are not as dependent on, nat- on the Russian natural gas as other member states. Okay, so um, here are some geopolitical factors that come into play um, which affect the issue. Okay, so essentially you are telling me, Jahid, that the most important problem, the, the major impact of rising energy prices goes to consumers. Right. Okay. Linking this with fundamental economic theory, the reduction in um, in uh, so does this lead lead to a reduction in consumer spending overall, or are they spending uh, less just on energy? So I think that the energy is rather related to the uh, confidence in the economy rather than the spending patterns, 
because we know from um, empirical evidence that spending will always remain at a certain level, provided that the confidence is high. Consumers have no problem borrowing to, in order to sustain their spending if they are sure that the economy will prosper and grow in the future. So what higher energy prices precisely does is that um, it basically signals to rational economic agents within the macroeconomy that um, the, um, the system that we live in is leading towards a negative um, growth scheme, let's say. And then this, in my opinion, renders both consumer and business confidence, because when consumers become less confident, they tend to spend less. If they spend less, businesses make less, less profits. And in addition, when businesses have higher costs from energy, when these two effects are combined, they will also have less confidence, which leads to lower investment, and then international competitiveness will also deteriorate. Okay, so you're talking about a chain reaction of a reduction in, in consumer confidence, which leads to a reduction in business confidence, which, which leads to a reduction in international competitiveness, right? Yes. Anything that we want to add here? So could things be made worse through a concept? Because uh, as soon as you told me, as soon as you mentioned uh, to that, immediately what I what I thought of is the negative multiplier. Okay. Mm. So um, essentially, does this lead? to a situation where we have more leakages than injections leading to a negative multiplier or energy prices are not highly correlated um, to this theme? There, there is indeed a negative multiplier, but in my opinion, it's a combination of factors, not energy itself. And for example, you can see the case of the UK where mm -hmm. the announcement of the mini budget by the ex-minister Liz Truss led to investors to fly away from the market and we saw a collapse in the exchange, almost a collapse in the exchange rate of the UK. So on top of that, the high inflation leads to lower confidence and uh, in combination with the energy crisis, it, it might lead to a, a greater negative multiplier. Okay, so you are suggesting that there is a cure for this. So if appropriate policies are used, do you think there is a way to tackle the impact of energy? of rising pri energy prices? Uh, well, probably you can't find, you can find a cure, but not in the short run. It should, we should have not noticed a while ago our uh, over-dependence, I mean, as Europe, on Russian gas and should have increased investment in green energy. We cannot make the switch in green energy overnight. Mm -hmm. So in a way, if in the short run, we are stuck with uh, high prices. Okay. But at least there, there is a switch happening to... Okay. All right. Let's talk a bit um, uh, more about business confidence. So you are telling me that the main issue of a reduction in business confidence is the increase in energy prices, therefore the increase in production costs. Okay. As we know from economic theory, this has an impact on short-run aggregate supply. Right. It creates cost push inflation. It is a situation that we are dealing now. Right. Are there any more long run issues that could result from this uh, situation? Yes. So the future supply of firms is dependent on their current investment, um, which is dependent on their confidence. So basically, when the short run aggregate supply, as you mentioned, decreases, they will have less profits left over in order to invest, which will ultimately reduce the future long run ag aggregate supply. OK, I want to discuss a bit um, the link between European policies and more particularly the increase in interest rates um, in order to tackle inflation, okay, which is a result of what, according to what we are discussing here, ultimately what has led to this cost push inflation and uh, the implementation of uh, rising interest rates as a policy is uh, the increase in energy prices, right? So essentially, is there a link between this and uh, the reduction in, in, in investment, Yanni? Yeah, of course there is. I mean, um, if each time you buy your raw materials, they are more expensive than the previous time, mm -hmm. you're going to think twice before you uh, invest in like a new uh, project, which uh, you cannot even plan for... Uh, because a business, we want to plan ahead and see how much return will that uh, project bring me and what are the costs. But you don't know the costs if they are changing all the time. Uh, so it's difficult to plan as well. And 
Uh, okay. So essentially we are describing a situation of low investment, high inflation, low consumer confidence, low business confidence, which is, allow me to say, um, uh, um, introduced through a magnified um, um, issue because businesses don't invest for two purposes, for two reasons. Primarily because they have low confidence because of low consumption and because of rising interest rates. Okay, so... Yes, and here arises another conflict because traditional monetary policy theory states that we increase our interest rates to lower uh, consumption and investment but since we are dealing with uh, cost push inflation and not only demand pu uh, demand pull inflation this time, actually increasing interest rates might have a, an adverse effect effect on the firms that borrow to cover their raw material costs. Okay, are there any particularities in the economy of Cyprus that make it particularly difficult and dangerous for us? So what what are our what are our main exports? What is our source of economic power? Let's say in terms of exports. It's tourism. It's uh, tourism, it's services, okay? Financial services. Financial yes. services and so on, okay? So, the increase in, in interest rates and the increase in energy prices, do you think it has a particular impact on our market, on our potential, and why is that? Okay, so um, let's imagine a hotel, let's say, which is producing a fixed amount of output. So, in order to... Um, increase their output, they have to invest, right? Mm -hmm. And they have their revenues and their costs. Mm -hmm. Now, these fluctuations in prices suggest that um, future fluctuations in their costs can um, impact their uh, profits, right? Okay. And when they increase their volume, given that the costs might exceed their revenues, they increase their risk. Because if they increase their volume, the loss they make on each product is multiplied even more. Okay. So my point is that they might be afraid to increase their volume and hence if we go back to the chain, they might be um, scared to invest to increase their output. Okay, all right. But this is uniform, right? It can happen to any country. Uh, yes, uh, as my friend suggested, this is a domestic effect. But uh, for the case of Cyprus, when studying in context and since we heavily depend on FDI and especially Russian foreign direct investment, to recover from the 2008 financial crisis. Now with the war and our overexposure to Russian assets, we face a problem to attract uh, further FDI. Okay, so what I have in mind is the following. Does the nature of our exports, which in terms of elasticity is what? Elastic. elastic. They are very elastic. Is there a particular impact for us? from this perspective. So essentially, you have told me at the beginning, we are discussing that this increase in production cost may be passed on to consumers, right? So why could this be detrimental for our exports? Considering that, as you said, they are elastic. I'm guessing you are referring to a current account deficit and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. maybe import penetration. Mm -hmm. if Yanni? Yeah. Yanni? Uh, Yes, basically, uh, if the uh, services are more expensive, mm -hmm. uh, there are other places in the world that are probably less affected, mm -hmm. uh, outside Europe probably. Uh, so the, the Russian investors or investors in general are going to uh, switch to other uh, uh, countries. Okay, so essentially you are telling us that prices matters matter more in services. if what you export is elastic yes. and in this case services yes right so we are as you said it in a particularly dangerous situation considering the structure of our economy all of its particularities and um, all of our capabilities i was wondering are there any opportunities coming out from this crisis well, there are a lot. Uh, first of all, okay, uh, Cyprus is a member state that is at least dependent on the Russian natural gas in the EU, but prices are still rising. So this forces us to switch to green energy uh, faster than what we would, because in general the the Cypriot culture is not 
so fond of uh, renewables until about why until, uh, uh, maybe because um, well fossil fuels are cheaper uh, probably uh, more efficient uh, in the short term of course uh, and probably because we we just didn't use the the EU uh, funds correctly the ones allocated for Okay, uh, but anyway, as a society, sorry for interrupting you, as a society, we do spend lots of money, okay, in expensive stuff. Yes, we do. So, how could this be solved? Uh, <laughs> we must understand that the long-term benefits of green energy, uh, and, and not just green energy, but uh, energy produced domestically in general, which mm -hmm. will make us energy secure mm -hmm. and so it would not be import dependent mm -hmm. um, it would benefit us in the long run uh, I, I mean now uh, Cy Cyprus's top import is refined petroleum which had more than 1 billion euros I mean it, it's gonna also improve the current account a lot if we produce oh. domestically All right. the energy um, how? I mean, yes. How could we, we produce en energy domestically? Uh, first of all, since we have 326 days of sunshine, uh, it's obvious that solar power is key here. I mean, uh, we are we are already trying to uh, boost the uh, installment of uh, solar panels on houses, but there has not been a large scale uh, project yet that would significantly affect the energy. Uh, uh, outlook, uh, but what we could do, which uh, a lot of countries in Europe started doing, is actually, uh, and many people might have not heard of it, but it's floating solar panels, which can be placed on um, uh, reservoirs throughout Cyprus, uh, and this has two uh, positive effects. First of all, the energy uh, produced by those solar panels is more efficient than conventional solar panels because the water below cools the panels uh, and also on top of that we are solving the water scarcity issue that Cyprus has because uh, it significantly reduces the evaporation from the reservoirs of the water since they, they are covered in solar panels Okay, uh, so, so you are covering, sorry, you are covering, um, you are dams let's say, and yes. you are lakes, okay, this kind with, of water, okay, with right. solar panels mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, although it might be 30% more expensive than uh, conventional ones, mm -hmm. uh, they do not waste any scarce land. Uh, that I mean, we are an island, our land is quite limited. Yes, but uh, we are full of mountains and full of, of, of uh, unused yes. spaces, which... Yes, uh, but the, the dams are unused spaces as well. Okay. Uh, and the fact that we can also um, secure our water supply at the same time Mm -hmm. as well as having more efficient uh, solar panels, uh, mm -hmm. I think is uh, uh, something that other countries have started using. How does uh, it sound? Interesting and new. Interesting and new. Good. Of course, another, uh, another uh, possibility, which, well, since our tourism industry is like 20% of uh, our whole economy, uh, it generates a lot of waste. That waste uh, could be uh, with multiple different um, ways uh, be turned into energy. Uh, you've got gasification, combustion. There's a lot of different processes which convert waste, uh, and that includes also agricultural waste as well. Uh, I'm talking basically about biomass energy. Okay. Um, okay. But especially as our tourism industry, because it generates a lot of waste. Uh, and actually, Sweden has uh, started doing this, mm -hmm. um, turning okay. their garbage into energy. Ah, so they're using garbage. Uh, yes, and uh, they also solve the problem of um, excessive reliance on landfills as well. Okay, so essentially, if I get it correctly, you say that primarily you are getting the um, human waste, okay? Plus, you are and getting garbage. And, yes. and ga yes. which is human waste. Yes, yes. Okay, so you can also use industrial waste, the garbage that comes from businesses. Considering that everyone works until five o'clock, so you are going to have people working 
right? And generating, generating waste um, in their jobs, right? Plus, you've mentioned agriculture, and I really like that because um, our uh, agricultural sector, even though it's not um, a substantial part of our GDP, is there, and we have lots of people who are dependent uh, on, agric on agriculture, especially in villages. Yes. So, um, actually, I'm, I, I was wondering why uh, this kind of energy has not been promoted over the years since we have a substantial um, uh, tourist sector, okay, and a noticeable agricultural sector. I, I think... Uh it, it's mostly that people are not so aware of this um, method of generating energy. Like okay. The most popular ones are solar, wind, hydro, but uh, you rarely hear about um, biomass being talked a lot. Okay. So awareness is something... Yes. Uh, okay. Do you think, guys, awareness is something which should be part of policy? Of course it should be part of policy. For example, in Vienna, they have a factory employing these techniques in the middle of the city center. Mm -hmm. But in Cyprus, given the fact that we lack the campaigns to inform the consumers, they wouldn't easily accept uh, such a factory. So, yes, campaigns are essential part of policy in order to inform consumers and inform them about the positive externalities of employing such methods and mm -hmm. as well about the negative externalities of producing electricity using uh, petroleum products because once you are uh, aware of the negative effects that this kind of petroleum production has on you and your um, surroundings, then you accept uh, change much more easily. Okay, all right. Um, is this a long-term policy or a short-term policy? It should be both a short-term and a long-term policy because in the short-term, you'll uh, achieve the to inform the consumers mm -hmm. but since generations change and it's a cycle of life you need a consistent policy to inform uh, the new generations about it how do you inform new generations you inform new generations through schools through education so <laughs> through podcasts like this <laughs> through podcasts like this eh, but considering that we are a school right and this is an educational activity, I think that the role of education in uh, in this perspective is quite important and uh, it is something that policymakers should actually consider seriously. It's, but since we are talking about policy, let's move to... Uh, do you have anything else to add? Are there uh, any more opportunities? Yeah, I was just going to add that um, <laughs> there's another energy um, a method of producing energy that again, people are not aware of, especially in Cyprus, uh, it's geothermal. And we are right above the boundary of the um, African and Anatolian tectonic plates, mm -hmm. which means that there is a fault line mm -hmm. just below the, uh, just south of the coast of Limassol, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, could easily, we could easily extract uh, and produce geothermal energy from the heat uh, they are, uh, which is also renewable again. Uh, okay. And also and one of the most efficient methods of yes. uh, green energy. But, but we have invested, I don't know, maybe zero in that. Uh, it uh, sounds it uh, sounds expensive though, doesn't it? It, it is. is expensive, yes, uh, but um, <laughs> you need to... Uh, okay. I mean, we, we do have uh, millions of, dollar, uh, of euros coming in from the EU to fund such projects and we are just not taking advantage of them uh, that no. efficiently. I uh, mean, may, may, I may I evaluate? Mm -hmm. like the, the evaluation for this point is that these projects cost billions. And uh, there are, the costs of switching are very high. Mm -hmm. That the moment the technology we have is not as efficient as employing uh, petroleum for electricity production. So a firm, considering that they have a short-term approach since in the long run, as famously said, we are all dead. Mm -hmm. They choose to stick with uh, petroleum products because of habitual behavior and lower costs. Okay, which is irrational, essentially. Um, so, 
Judging by the current gas and electricity prices, though, the cost of not switching will be much greater in the long run than the cost in of In the switching. long run, correct, correct, correct. Yeah, and also uh, another benefit, uh, I mean, Turkey is the second uh, largest uh, consumer of geothermal energy mm-hmm. after China, okay. which is in the s- same area for the same reasons. Uh, and another benefit of this is that you can directly hit homes uh, without even converting it to electricity and then back to heating, which is much more efficient okay. than just uh, having this close-minded view of we need to convert everything to electricity in order to do everything else. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, okay. so setup costs are high, intermediary costs though uh, up and until it reaches a household are not so dramatic or maybe even zero. Okay, since we are at this part, um, any ideas about policies? So up to now we've done what? We have identified the issue, okay? So we have described the crisis. We have seen some opportunities, okay, that result from this crisis as from any uh, other crisis. So essentially the opportunities investing in renewable energy uh, and any type of green energy. So now the final question is the how, policies. Okay, what would you do if you were the government? What kind of policies would you use? Uh, first, I'd like to mention that policies for a country should always be examined in context, given the geography, the geopolitical situation, and so on. And uh, Cyprus is the only EU member that failed to meet the 10% uh, electricity interconnection networks from the EU members. Mm-hmm. And essentially, we recorded a 0% means we are uh, an isolated electricity network. And as we mentioned, isolated electricity networks employ petroleum, they have higher cost of production and so on. However, we are indeed a special case because we are an island and uh, the policy should be studied in that context. And uh, first of all, I'd like to mention that there is already a project in place, uh, Eurasia, which uh, its aim is to connect Cyprus with uh, Greece, their electricity networks. So we can reach that uh, interconnection target. And uh, this uh, interconnection will attract FDI since we secure uh, a more reliable network and okay. uh, cheaper mm-hmm. uh, costs of production. Mm-hmm. Uh, another pol- uh, policy that will uh, soon be implemented is a privatization of uh, electricity authority. And as I mentioned earlier, this le- relies heavily on the concept of uh, competition and promoting R&D and so on. Mm -hmm. However, uh, this should be done very carefully, given the fact that the uh, energy uh, stock stock exchange market proved to have some mistakes. For example, we have a lot of of case studies from Greece and the mistakes in their uh, electricity stock market exchange. And uh, we should only pass the extra needs through that market and have long-term contracts. Can you please very, very briefly explain the stock market uh, issues? Yes, uh, of course. Um, So the electricity network should always run to meet the demand on that particular time because of the technology now we cannot store energy it's very difficult to store energy so once you turn on the switch there should be a generator on the other side being turned so you can uh, have the electricity and you have the stock market to regulate that however to be fair when when the stock market was introduced the gas the natural gas prices were very low because of the Russian gas Mm -hmm. pumping into Europe at at very low prices. Mm -hmm. So the EU was worried that this will uh, overthrow the green energy. So they set a rule where your uh, price being charged is the highest in the stock exchange, as to be fair to the rest of the producers that rely on green energy. Mm -hmm. Uh, But now with the war, and this in reality started a little bit before the war because we realized that green gas, uh, green natural natural gas is not as green as we thought because the, f- the carbon footprint of extraction of natural gas is very high, especially in Russia where is, there is no regulation on how the gas extracted. So we essentially exported the pollution to Russia. Mm-hmm. And uh, after we realized that, the, pr- the prices of gas uh, started rising mm-hmm. and uh, further exacerbated by the war as we discussed. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. now the price being set to the maximum is uh, skyrocketing because of that, because of the price of gas that 
uh, skyrocketed in, in the past year. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's the issues with the stock market. And this is especially the case for Greece, where every single need of uh, electricity production passes through uh, the, electri- the, the energy market. Mm-hmm. And uh, the proposal and the uh, policy that the EU will implement soon is that Uh, we should have long-term contracts, pre-negotiated contracts on energy, Mm -hmm. so we can negotiate a set price and only pass the extra needs through the market as a way to... And avoid speculation, And avoid speculation, basically. Okay. Uh, As you said, and uh, this uh, this case should be extensively studied before implementing such a market in Cyprus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. Any other policies? Any other policies is the policies we mentioned before with uh, the subsidization of uh, solar panels and other alternative methods, preferably uh, green methane, which is natural gas essentially, but being extracted in a much greener and uh, regulated way. Okay. And also... Uh, is that met- is related to yes. farming. Ca- can this uh, uh, be obtained uh, from farming purposes or, or uh, are there any... The, the methane production. Well, yeah. the, the technologies there are very new and there is research being done right now. Okay. But there is that possibility. That the, the green methane, it's a long, long-term long policy. Okay. okay. And uh, there is also ISMET, uh, despite concerns for the viability mm-hmm. of ISMET by the US, by the fact that it employs uh, natural gas and so on, the EU has agreed to go on with that project and subsidizes that project. Mm-hmm. And we also, along with that, we have the liquefied natural gas platforms, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. which introduce a, a European source of natural gas into the European market. So we can reduce our overdependence in Russia, essentially. Mm-hmm. And the introduction of natural gas in the Cyprus market will increase competition, lower costs, and achieve the desirable fall in price. Okay, okay. Something which uh, I haven't heard uh, um, neither in our discussion or in the overall general discussions about energy is about the subsidization of uh, bioenergy in terms of creating the appropriate infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So, for example, even in areas, and I'm talking about agricultural areas now, uh, where the uh, bio bioenergy projects um, are, are becoming a bit popular, Um, some studies, a recent study we've done uh, in, in, uh, previously with sc- school students, shows guys that uh, sometimes it's not profitable and it acts, um, uh, on the contrary, it's very costly and uh, it acts against profitability for some farmers to transport agricultural waste in the places that uh, they are going to be turned into energy in, in, in um, uh, bioenergy uh, um, uh, facilities. Well, there are a lot of studies to suggest that there is a bit of a regressive nature in switching to green energy because because of that, because of the very high costs. So it's a sort of a J-curve effect? Yes, yes, it's, it's exactly a J-curve effect because until the farmers are convinced to switch, there is a time lag and an increase in costs. Okay, so, so here we have another policy. Uh, another policy potential. How are we going to convince farmers to join? All right. Okay. Any other policies? Um, I, I will add another policy, which uh, I don't know if it can count as a policy, but I'm going to come to the back to the point of education mm-hmm. and awareness. Mm-hmm. But this time, not for um, the awareness of um, other possible energy sources, mm-hmm. but also for the conservation of energy. And the fact that we can uh, build homes that are more energy efficient, have uh, double glazed windows, insulated um, ceilings, walls. Um, yes, there, there is uh, a policy implemented, a subsidization yes. for uh, this type of housing. Okay. And uh, it's a very good thing because you essentially promote positive externalities that uh, otherwise consumer wouldn't have done it themselves because the cost of a double glazed window it's higher than a than a normal window so having the subsidy in place encourages uh, consumers to to implement such uh, techniques and, and even going further than that educating people to be more um, uh, 
conservative with their energy use, not wasting it. Uh, yeah. wh- when they can walk somewhere, they should not take their car, which is uh, another cultural thing in Cyprus. Yeah, but however, uh, uh, sorry for the interruption, uh, that relies heavily on the infrastructure we have. Of as, course, mm-hmm. same infrastructure. As we mentioned previously, because implementing policies before having the necessary infrastructure, it's a counterproductive. Okay. Yes. So essentially, it's a mixture of supply side policies and demand side policies. But as um, things uh, appear to be, uh, the most effective policies are the long run policies, which are the supply side policies, which take time to be implemented. <clears throat> um, I guess, and, and unfortunately, it took us a while to realize that we should implement those supply side policies. And now we are a bit <laughs> behind. <Okay. Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope that um, the uh, policies that we are going to get when we have the minister at school are going to satisfy um, um, our uh, concerns and so on. Um, Okay, I guess this brings us to the end uh, of our discussion. Thank you guys for all of your research and uh, the work you've done. So uh, a quick recap. So first of all, uh, energy is important, okay? Energy is life, essentially. Without energy, we cannot develop, we cannot exist. Um, Energy, like uh, in every market, leads to crisis uh, with and I and uh, and E. Uh, So um, we have to be vigilant, we have to be uh, always ready uh, to develop the necessary policies because we know that there are many opportunities resulting out of energy crisis, like in every crisis. Of course, we should be proactive, though, not wait for the crisis and then <laughs> look for the opportunities and the policies. <laughs> Hopefully, you as the next generation will be proactive enough uh, when uh, you come at the right age uh, to uh hunt uh, to the next generation a better world uh, i think people now young people are more aware um uh, it's just that i hope that the short run profit motive does not uh interfere with the uh long run uh investments potentials and yes potentials mm-hmm. That, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because that's what it's holding us back, basically. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I agree with uh, all of the things you said, but particularly it's energy that the economy revolves around. And whether it's a farmer in the suburbs or a skyscraper or trading stock derivatives, all of them are dependent on the supply of energy to some extent at least. And I think that it's our job to figure out the best and most efficient and most beneficial way, more importantly, to um, extract that energy. Best way to finish this talk. Thank you again so much. Uh, let me thank again uh, Alpha News for providing us the uh, facilities for this post- podcast. Um, hopefully, uh, we would see, uh, we would have lots of people in our event next Friday, 9th uh, of December at 4.30. At the English uh, School. At the English School's Lecture Theatre. Thank you again so much. We're going to have you. food. <laughs> <laughs>